Texas Fight, Book 8 of the America Falls series, written by Scott Medbury, narrated by Adam Barr. Copyright 2022, Scott Medbury. All rights reserved. Episode 4. Chapter 17. Branches whipped the side of the truck. The morning sun was now high in the sky, and the survivors, covered in dirt, blood, and ash, stared longingly at the overgrown track ahead as the truck neared its destination. When they finally arrived at the clearing at the southern edge of camp, their campmates came pouring out from the tents and shelters. Before she could even turn off the vehicle, Their people, followed closely by a frantic grandpa, were moving in and around the weary survivors as they climbed down, covering the truck with loose branches and grass to camouflage it. Where's Haley? Grandpa shouted, pushing people out of the way. The tone of his plaintive call cut through Jack. It was unadulterated fear. I'm here, old man, she said, ducking under a tall kid throwing a branch over the top of the truck's cabin. Grandpa fumbled past everyone and ran into his daughter's arms. Thank God, he breathed as they embraced. The old man wore his heart on his sleeve, and Jack caught the unmistakable sob of relief. But he was more surprised at the tears he saw in Haley's eyes. He watched them, thinking of his own parents for the first time in a long time. He wiped a tear from his own eye. When they broke apart, Grandpa looked around at the others in the party, clearly counting heads before looking at Haley sharply. Theo? Haley shook her head, clearly not trusting herself to speak. Oh, no. Poor Theo. Okay, called Haley, suddenly all business again. Finish covering the truck. Jack and Aid, go to the medical tent for treatment. Murphy. Please organize a stretcher for Jessie and stay with her when they bring her down, while I go with Grandpa and the boys to get things ready. Grandpa went to Jessie, who had been helped down from the truck and was resting in the shade of a tree with Murphy at her side. His eyes were pained as he looked her over. We'll get you right as rain, young Jessie. Just relax here till they bring you down. Jack turned to follow Grandpa when he got back up. Haley and Aid had already set off. From the corner of his eye, he saw movement in the people that had gathered and turned to see Jen nudging her way through the crowd. He stopped and waited for her, unsure how to greet her given their recent history. He didn't have to worry. While he smiled and raised a hand awkwardly, she walked right up to him and took him in a bear hug. Thank God you're okay. Is everyone back safe this time? Jack's brain froze at the question. How was he to break the news that they had lost someone else? Thankfully, Grandpa came to his rescue, swiveling and putting a hand on Jen's shoulder as she and Jack separated. Jen, we lost Theo. No. It wasn't Jen who screamed. In fact, She took the news stoically and instead turned her concerned eyes on Ruby, the red-haired survivor who had screamed the denial and was now bent over double as grief took a hold of her. Theo died saving us, Jack announced, in a solemn voice loud enough for all to hear as Jen went to the girl. He died to save us. He died a hero. It's true. Jesse said weakly as she was lifted onto the stretcher. He made me promise to run. Any, no, Ruby said, hand to her mouth. The other onlookers all looked shocked, and Jack had to admit, if one of them wasn't going to make it back alive, he wouldn't have picked Theo to be the one. What happened? I thought it was a stealth mission. Did, did something go wrong? Bradley, one of the younger kids, piped up. Murphy put a supportive arm around Jesse, almost as if to shield her from any more questions. Enough questions, Jack said. There'll be a debrief later. 
Clear the way so we can get Jessie to triage. Haley stretched the kinks from her back as she breathed in the cool night air. It had been a long day, but it was done now, and she was done too. The survivors had all been seen to, and the worst of them, Jessie, was resting comfortably. The shrapnel that had been lodged deep in the flesh of her buttock removed and the wound stitched. She was young and her physical injuries would heal quickly. The mental ones might take a little longer. Fatigued and aching from head to toe, Haley collapsed into an old deck chair in the corner, praying it wouldn't buckle and spill her onto the floor, today of all days. Rubbing her face with her hands, she leaned forward into and slowly worked at her eyes with the edges of her palms, as she finally began to fully process the events of the last 24 hours. They had a rat in camp. That much was clear. The Chinese could be just hours behind them. They needed a plan, but her mind was a wild mess. Letting out a long groan, she looked up at the ceiling of the tent and closed her eyes. Someone close by cleared their throat, and she opened her eyes. A familiar, silhouetted figure stood in the open doorway of the tent. Honey, Grandpa said. How are you feeling? Horrible, she grumbled. How's old Betsy? In bad shape, but nothing a little elbow grease can't fix. I could do with some of that elbow grease and a drink, she said struggling out of the chair. But first I need to clean myself up. Can you see a towel anywhere? Grandpa looked to the left, leaned into a clear plastic box and pulled out a fresh towel. Here you go, honey. And after you clean up, I want you in bed, you hear? You're no good to anyone if you're too tired to speak. Haley smiled. He knew her too well. They were peas in a pod. The old man had given her not just her genes, but had shaped so much of her life and her ways of thinking and coping with problems. He'd always been the one that helped her keep her fortitude in that gray zone between the culture of her American mother and Chinese father. She was an American, but of course, occasionally the 1% got through her defenses with a remark here or there. You speak such good English. Where are you from? Generally, those people, she was sure, meant no harm. There were worse, much worse, but they were few and far between. Now, none of it mattered. There was no America anymore. They were all just survivors now, although she was sure the invaders would judge them as traitors. Mom would have been so proud of him. But what would she have made of me losing two kids in as many weeks? As if hearing her thoughts, he stepped forward, put a hand on her arm, and shook his head. I want you to get rid of those demons in your head. You hear me, kid? You're a fighter, and you did what you had to do. Your mother would have understood that, too. This was war. I know, Dad, but... Don't lose your fighting spirit. You're our strongest, and we need it. The enemy is out there and they'll spend every waking moment trying to extinguish it. You fight for you, and you'll be strong enough to fight for us. She smiled and wiped a tear away from her eye. Always the way with words, Dad. Don't worry. They haven't knocked the fight out of me yet. Good, he said. That's my girl. Now go get washed up, and I'll bring you that drink to help you get off to sleep. I'll take care of this family of ours tonight. We ain't done living yet. No, Haley nodded, tucking the towel under her arm and following him through the door. No, we're not. The next morning, Jack left camp early and headed for the lake for some alone time. When he got there, he sat down in the tall grass, watching the wind chop at the lake's surface and enjoyed the cooling breeze of another hot summer's day. It felt weird to be back in his spot. The last time he'd been here, Robert and Theo were still alive, and a chirpy Jen had come to find him and bring him back to camp. 
In the process, she had lifted his spirits immeasurably. Something told him Jen wouldn't be looking for him this time. And though he'd ventured out from the camp for solitude, a small part of him wanted someone to come out to comfort him. After an hour in the sun, he went back into the shade of a large oak tree. Despite growing up in California, he still burned easily. He'd burn red, then fade back to his usual pale within days. His sister Katie, on the other hand, would always tan, and Dad would always joke that she'd got the mailman's genes. Jack bowed his head as the grief over his lost family unexpectedly overwhelmed him and tears spilled onto his jeans. He tried to drive it away, but that only opened up a vivid slideshow of all the people he'd killed. Larry Dawson, the pervert neighbor, the soldiers who had attacked Katie, the female soldier who'd surprised them at the school, all the others in Sacramento, Huntsville, Cold Spring, and the latest at the fuel facility. A chorus of gunfire and screams played as a soundtrack. Eventually, he knew the only way to silence the noise in his head was to get up and get moving. So he headed back to camp. The walk was uneventful and seemed twice as long as the first leg. When he got back to Camp Lisa, everyone seemed to be busy doing something, and he felt a tinge of guilt at going MIA. He waved at Ruby as he walked by but only got a sharp nod in return, as the eyes of other kids around her followed him. The same again when he passed the group working on that night's meal. Some of the glances were downright hostile. What's up with that? He asked himself. He passed Aid coming from the trenches with a bag of potatoes. Hey, Aid, is everything okay? Where have you been? Aid said quietly, putting the potatoes down and stepping in close. I, I just went for a walk to clear my head. Why? What's happening? Man, you need to make sure you clear it with Haley next time. The rumor about the mole is out and people are getting paranoid. You disappearing like that has tongues wagging. Jack frowned. What? Jack hissed. I'm not the fucking mole. I was there, remember? Aide gestured for him to keep his voice down and looked around. Jack, you don't have to convince me of shit but you know how rumors can spread. So just go and speak with Haley and Gramps, quick. God damn it, Jack said, shaking his head and feeling a deep sense of betrayal in his guts. I know. The sooner we find this mole and take care of them, the better. Chapter 18 So angry was Jack from his campmate's suspicion that he went straight to his tent. As far as he was concerned, they could all go to hell. How could they even think he was the traitor? The idea was so stupid, it incensed him. As soon as he was lying down on his bedroll, though, the exhaustion overtook him, and not even the seething anger could prevent him from closing his eyes. He fell into a fitful sleep. He wasn't sure how long he was out, but when he awoke from his heavy sleep, dazed and confused, the light of the day was fading and he was hot and sweaty from the humidity in the zipped-up tent. He groaned as he rolled off his bedroll and stood up. His anger had subsided somewhat, and as he pulled his sweaty shirt away from his armpit and sniffed, he decided he would wash up before he went to see Haley and Grandpa. Grabbing his towel and the sliver of soap he had left, he ducked through the tent flaps and headed for the showers. He'd barely taken two paces when somebody's arm wrapped itself around his throat from behind and dragged him backwards as a second figure, wearing a mask and hoodie, lunged toward him and sunk a fist into his belly. The air was expelled from his lungs in an explosive gasp, and Jack sagged against the person who had accosted him from behind. Dazed, he put his hands up to the arm around his neck. Fucking rat! spat the guy in front of him and swung again this time connecting it with his jaw. Seeing stars, but knowing the guy would wind up for another punch any second, Jack lifted his feet and let the guy behind take his full weight, dragging him over enough until he let go, causing the assailant's next punch to hit his own guy in the face. 
Jack then lashed out with his foot and took the puncher in the groin. That was enough for the cowards, who, swearing and groaning in pain, sprinted off as Jack rolled over and tried to get his breath back. Jack looked after them, but in the twilight and wearing hoodies, there was no way to tell for sure who they were, although the one clutching his groin was built a lot like Bradley, a 15-year-old kid who, up until now at least, he liked and had gotten along with really well. Feeling more emotionally hurt than injured, he picked himself up, dusted himself off, and headed for the washroom. He was almost there when Grandpa rounded the corner of a distant tent. Ah, Jack, I was just coming to see... What happened? The old man said when he saw Jack's bruised cheek. Hey, Grandpa, he coughed. Nothing. I'm okay. Nothing doesn't leave a bruise like that. Jack shook his head. It was just a misunderstanding. Tell me who did this. I won't have dissent in this camp. Grandpa, it's nothing. And I didn't see who it was. Jack winced when Grandpa reached out to touch his cheek gently. They're just looking for someone to blame, and I'm the obvious choice for being the rat, because I haven't been here as long, and because I like to wander off. Well, I won't have vigilantes roaming the camp. Haley and I are figuring it out. Until then, life will go on as normal. Jack gestured to his face. Seems everyone else wants to find the rat, too. I'm sorry, kid. Really, I am. I'll make an announcement at dinner. But in the meantime, I have an idea that will keep you busy and outside the camp until things blow over. Like the sound of that? Yeah, he said. That's exactly what I need right now. Good. Because I sure could use your help getting Betsy fighting fit. They arranged to meet at the truck the next morning at 6 a.m. The evening meal had been hell for Jack. Every time he caught someone looking his way, he was paranoid they were thinking he was the rat. The big smile Jen gave him when she sat down opposite him for dessert warmed him. If Jen had looked at him with suspicion, it would have been the last straw. With her and Grandpa and Haley on his side, he could deal with the misguided distrust of the rest of the camp. It was nice, waking up and walking through camp while everyone else was asleep. Grandpa was already at the truck, uncovering it after topping up the fuel with a jerry can. You sure we shouldn't walk? Jack asked. In case the truck is spotted from the air? Grandpa laughed. <laughs> you can walk if you want, kid, but it's a little too far for my old legs. Jack had never been given the privilege of seeing Betsy or where exactly she was stationed. It was a closely guarded secret between Grandpa and Haley and maybe two of Jack's campmates. He suspected that was mainly because the old man occasionally needed his own space, a man cave of sorts, but also because it was possibly the most vital piece of self-defense weaponry they had. Now their caution in keeping its location secret turned out to be absolutely the right call, and Jack knew he didn't have to worry about the two camp leaders doubting his trustworthiness if he was being let in on the secret. When Grandpa turned the truck about and left Camp Lisa, they headed deeper into the forest rather than out toward open ground, which is what Jack was expecting him to do. Trees whipped at the side of the truck, and hanging on the rearview mirror, a set of prayer beads wobbled back and forth in time with the bouncing of the truck, threatening to fly off on particularly violent turns and bumps. Grandpa had told him in his first month at camp that his dead wife had been a staunch Roman Catholic. When she had passed in the fighting, Grandpa had vowed to carry it with him everywhere he went. After 15 minutes of driving, they came to an abrupt stop in the very heart of the National Park. From here we go on foot, kid. Jack climbed out and peered around. The road they'd traveled was barely recognizable as an off-road track, but they were in a flattened area now, ringed on the edges by cut tree branches and trunks. Come on now, this way, he grumbled, rolling his denim shirt sleeves to the elbows. Jack was glad he'd worn his hiking boots as he followed Grandpa into an opening in the undergrowth. Back at camp, Haley waved to Aid and Murphy 
who pulled a crudely built timber structure trap to the edge of the big, freshly dug hole on the outskirts of camp. With ropes, they lowered it into the hole, and once in place, they covered it with a net and kicked leaves and sticks over it to camouflage it. Careful you don't lose your balance, said Haley. Crude it might be, but the six sharpened stakes protruding from the top would be a deadly welcome for anyone who fell in, hopefully an enemy soldier. Elsewhere around the wide perimeter of Camp Lisa, Haley acted as operations director pointing and ordering small groups she had organized into setting up various wire trips and other traps hidden in holes. Tonight, when they were all laid, she would take groups of the campmates around until they had all committed the locations of the traps to memory. A hundred yards out from the perimeter of the camp, they set up trip wires strung between trees at shin height. The end of each trip wire went into a contraption they nailed to a tree, out of sight. Haley knelt down in the mud and pointed to the last one they had rigged to go. Ruby looked curious, combing her sweaty red hair behind her ears and frowning. Want to see how this works? Yeah, she said, fascinated. I don't get how you fire a bullet without a gun. Haley smiled, adjusting the bandana that was tied over her forehead, keeping her hair back. Right, well, these aren't bullets. They are shotgun shells. But do you know what makes a bullet shot from a gun? Trigger? Not quite. To keep it basic, there's a whole bunch of pins and springs inside a gun. And in essence, when you pull the trigger, it makes the hammer slam home into a firing pin, which is like a spring behind the bullet. That firing pin hits the primer, which causes an explosion, which ignites the gunpowder within the cartridge. All the expanding gas from that inside the chamber. That's happening all inside the gun's chamber? Ruby gawked, mouth falling open. Haley laughed. Sure is. And boom. That's how a bullet flies out so fast. And why the chamber releases and an empty cartridge is expelled. That's why you kids have to clean up all those bits of metal, as you call them. Ah, okay. So, is that how this trap is meant to work? Haley nodded. Similar, yes. Same principle. When someone trips the wire, it's connected to this bit here, which is attached to the mousetrap doohickey, and it snaps shut, creating that hammer and pin impact, and boom. Ruby stuck her tongue out in concentration, looking back and forth between the trip wire and the trap components on the tree. Will it hit them and kill them? No, these are shotgun shells so they'll explode. And it'll be loud, but there'll be limited damage. It'll be enough for what we want it to do, though, which is sound an alarm and give us time to prepare. But if we're lucky, one, maybe two soldiers might find themselves with a nice big hole blown through their legs. Amazing. Wow. I always learn so much from you, Haley. These lessons of yours sure be calculus. Haley frowned as the pair both stood, brushing off the dirt and leaves. You don't miss school? Not a bit? A shadow of the past flitted across Ruby's face, briefly. Then it was gone. I think I used to, she shrugged. But that's all gone now. Finally emerging from the trees after a difficult walk through the thick scrub, Jack was surprised to find a long stretch of open road, wide enough for a lane of traffic in each direction. Toward the end of it, he could make out two small holiday cabins, and to the right, a cabin with its own large garage. And perfect size, too, judging by the home DIY modifications that had been made to it since. Jack grinned. Guess you got busy and made it a home for Betsy, right? Grandpa winked. Damn right, kid. Keeps her out of sight, too. This piece of road was meant to link in, I think, but work was never finished. It's a dead end, and the cabins here are all unoccupied, most not even fitted with plumbing or electrics. Right, he said, following Grandpa over to the large garage, whose door had been removed and widened to allow space for Betsy to taxi in and out. Hang on, Jack said wiping some sweat from his brow. 
If there's no electricity, how do you work on Betsy? Old-fashioned way. Nails and hammers. Jack's face fell. What? Grandpa barked out a loud laugh that echoed into the trees, frightening a few birds into flight. He slapped Jack on the shoulder and ushered him into the garage. I'm just messing with you, kid. I found an old generator, which runs on gas. I use it sparingly, as we need reserves to run the trucks, but it doesn't use much. After Jack's eyes adjusted to the poor light inside the garage, he marveled at the World War II era plane, up close and personal. Aside from the damage from the recent encounter, it was a thing of beauty. Behind the plane sat rows of equipment, tools, and other items. Where should I begin? Grandpa winked at him, walked over to a large box, and pulled open the lid. Inside were thin pieces of sheet metal. He then pointed to a workbench on the opposite side, next to which stood a big tank attached to what looked like a welding tool. Ever use one of those? Jack shook his head. Well, you're about to. Chapter 19 Grandpa's trust of Jack seemed to ease some of the tension in camp, but Jack was more than happy to be off-site and working with Grandpa during the day. They had worked late into the night on the first day and had left camp again early the next morning. On a break the second day, it dawned on Jack that he hadn't even asked the old man where he'd gotten Betsy. Well, kid, he said, lighting a cigarette from a secret stash he had in the workshop. I wasn't joking when I said it was a museum piece, but a working one at that. When I returned from commercial flying, I joined a flight club. It was just a bunch of like-minded old boys that liked to tinker with beauties like this and, of course, fly them. When the virus hit at Christmas and I found out who was responsible, I went to the airfield and collected Betsy first thing. Who named her Betsy? Was it you? It was, he said. Named after my first girlfriend. Don't go telling Haley that, though. Jack laughed. I won't. After another few hours, they packed it up and headed back to camp. After two full days, Betsy was patched and repaired to Grandpa's satisfaction. It looked pretty rough to Jack, but the old man assured him it didn't need to be a work of art. The damage was only on the fuselage, none of the machinery or the wings, or I wouldn't be here talking about it, most likely. He rubbed the plane's flank fondly. I think scars are sexy don't you? Come, we'll fill her up and kick her over. Grandpa stepped up the ladder and squeezed himself into the cockpit. Come on up. Placing the toolkit down onto the workbench, Jack clambered up and stood on the wing, staring at the instrument panel. Wow, he whispered, looking at the confusing array of dials, switches, and gauges. Looks confusing. Not as complicated as you think said Grandpa. The old man proceeded to give him a brief explanation of the instruments. See? Nope, said Jack, still confusing. Grandpa chortled. Okay, son. Hop down and go out front so you don't get blown over. When Jack was safely outside, Grandpa kicked the engine over. It coughed and spluttered, but didn't start. It did the same on the second try. Grandpa swore after the third attempt and reached out and slapped the side of the plane. The engines roared to life on the fourth attempt, and Jack whooped when Grandpa gave him the thumbs up. The noise and smell of gasoline was overwhelming. Grandpa let it run for a few minutes, then switched it off. Once he'd climbed down, they put the rest of their tools away, and he put his arm around Jack's shoulders on the way through the door. Good job, son. Couldn't have done it without you. Right then, Jack was the happiest he'd been since America fell. By the time they got back to the newly fortified camp, it was dark, and dinner was being served up. Jack was starving and gratified that Murphy was in charge of the cooking. She was without a doubt the best of all of them, and the venison stew smelled delicious. Jack still had the feeling he was being watched with suspicion by a handful of the campmates, but the people that really mattered, 
Murphy, Aide, Haley, a quickly recovering Jesse, and of course, Grandpa, made a special effort to include him and loudly reinforced their trust. The only other opinion he cared about was Jen's. She was sitting across and three seats down from him and seemed withdrawn and solemn. But he didn't think it had anything to do with whatever gossip might be doing the rounds about him. Robert's death had changed her. But Theo's death so soon after seemed to have really nailed home just how tenuous their hold on safety and security was. He had a feeling she was suffering from depression and made a promise to himself to speak to her later. The talk at the table was almost non-existent. Haley had been working everyone hard to fortify their defenses and prepare for an attack they all felt was inevitable. The silence was broken when on the other table, Bradley muttered something to Todd, who was across from him. Huh? asked Todd. I said, what did your mom have to say today? You know, when you disappeared again. Todd reddened and bowed his head, staring down into his bowl of stew. She doesn't talk to me. I talk to her. Damn, nothing? No. Come on, Bradley, Jesse snapped. Give the kid a break. What he talks about to her is his business. Baby, Bradley said. Todd pushed his bowl away and got up, his face red with embarrassment. He left the mess tent without looking back. Whispering broke out amongst the other diners, and Jack spotted Grandpa squeeze Haley's hand when she made to stand up. Bradley sneered and looked around, his eyes falling on Jack. Something to say, rat? Hey, Grandpa shouted, making quite a few of the kids jump. No bullshit allegations until we get to the bottom of it, you got it? No response. I said, have you got it? Yes, sir, Bradley said, throwing Jack a baleful last glance before turning back to his stew. Colonel Zhang Li, in his perfectly pressed uniform, walked with Wong down one of the main thoroughfares in the city of Houston. A strong, cool wind whipped between the towering skyscrapers and buffeted them. Wong shivered, but it had nothing to do with the chill in the air. He had barely managed to survive the debacle at the fuel facility, only saving his ass when offering up the scalp of the lowly private Shi Lang. Lieutenant, you find yourself delivering this news at a very, very convenient time. General Howe will be arriving tomorrow morning for a conference with Texas Command. He will be pleased when you deliver the perpetrators of the horrendous crime against his daughter. I have informed him that you yourself will be leading the mission. Of course, if you fail. Colonel Zhang Li's voice was deep and silky smooth and left Wong cold inside. But, sir, my recommendation was to destroy the camp in a bombardment. Scorched earth, no survivors. Li waved his hand. No, that is not possible. The general wishes to be present at the execution. That means you will attack the camp by stealth and bring back the boy and the girl. I don't care what happens to the rest, but you will do this one thing. Wong felt like the noose around his neck had just tightened. Yes, sir. Excellent. I want your plans for the attack within the hour. Don't fail me, Wong. No, sir. Back in his office, Wong, still feeling sick to his stomach, drew up the plans for a land attack on the rebel encampment. He was relieved he hadn't killed the mole in camp after the failure of the ambush at the fueling facility. The day before, at their designated meeting, he had his liaison tell the boy an attack was imminent, and he would be spared only if he took a transponder into camp after months of pleading ignorance of the geography and muddying the waters about the exact location. It was a lie, of course. He would personally put a bullet in the child's head. Jack sat cross-legged on his bedroll, not yet tired enough to sleep. His talk with Jen had been unproductive. She denied she was depressed, but at least promised to talk to him as she was feeling down. Before he departed, he asked her if she had any ideas about who might be the mole in camp. I have no idea, she said. Everyone is so nice. 
I don't know if it's even true there is a mole or a rat or whatever you want to call them. That was Jen, always seeing the best in people. That single question stirred in his mind, kept him awake hours after he put his head on the pillow, but ironically, it wasn't until he began to drift off that a familiar face floated into his mind. Jack's eyes snapped open. Todd. It wasn't just embarrassment on his face earlier. It was guilt. Chapter 20 Jack woke up early and lay in his bedroll, weighing up how to handle the Todd thing. A little part of him, the part seething with righteous anger, wanted to confront him immediately, knife in hand. The calmer part of him reasoned that he couldn't be certain of Todd's guilt, at least not until he'd looked him in the eye and asked him the question. Calm Jack won out, and he decided to take his time and sit down to breakfast with everyone before he found Todd and attempted to confirm his suspicions. Todd was at breakfast when Jack arrived. He was sitting in a far corner, all alone, just like an unpopular kid at high school. Jack watched him from the corner of his eye as Murphy ladled oatmeal into his bowl. Cheers, Murph, he said distractedly. Everything okay? Jack looked at her intelligent eyes. Yeah, fine. Bad night's sleep is all. You're not the only one, she said, nodding past him. Jack looked around and saw Jen looking dejected as she half-heartedly spooned oatmeal into her mouth. He winked at Murphy. I'm on it. Hey, kiddo. Want some company? He asked Jen. Sure, she said, smiling politely. How did you sleep? He asked, glancing across at Todd as he ate. Okay, I guess. You? That small talk went on for a few minutes. Jen quiet and Jack distracted by the Todd situation. He'd only eaten half his oats when Todd got up and left, looking surreptitiously to his left and right before exiting the tent. Jack wolfed down the last of his breakfast, then looked at Jen. Want to go for a walk later? Maybe out to the lake? That'd be nice. But I don't think Haley wants people going past the perimeter with all the booby traps. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Wait, I've got a better idea. How about a game of chess? Jack knew she and her cousin Robert used to have a great rivalry when it came to chess. And the happiest he'd ever seen Jen was when the two of them were bickering over who was best. The suggestion seemed to perk her up a little, and she smiled the first genuine smile he'd seen her give in days. Okay, she said. But I'm not going to take it easy on you. He laughed. You better not, he said, standing up. I'll come find you at 7 p.m. Jack walked to the sleeping tents, but found no trace of Todd in or near his tent. Further investigation of the other common areas was fruitless, too. On a hunch, he decided to walk the perimeter. He traversed three quarters of the way around, careful of the traps and pitfalls, and was on the western side when he heard a rustling to his right. Jack froze and crouched behind a bush. Barely five seconds later, Todd emerged, stepping warily over a trip line. Todd, Jack called out and stepped in front of the smaller boy, who flinched and made to run. Jack grabbed his upper arm and pulled him back to face him. J Jack, what are you doing? Why are you- Quiet, Todd. What are you doing out here? You know none of us are supposed to go past the tree line. I, I, I was talking to- Your mom? Sorry, Todd. I'm not buying that story anymore. Todd shook his hand off. Well, what's it to you? Bradley was right. You always leave camp. Who knows what you're friggin' up to, dude? Jack took a step backwards to open the space between them and let his hands hang loosely by his side. From their hand-to-hand -hand training, he knew Todd could fight when he was desperate. So Jack intended to hit him hard and fast if it came to that. He grinned mirthlessly. You know, Grandpa has me fixing up old Betsy. 
What about before that? He shook his head. Not playing this game, Todd. Just come clean and we can talk about it. The whole camp knows you're the rat, Jack, Todd yelled, taking a step backwards, then another. Don't move, Todd. Let's just shit. The smaller kid took off, jumping the tripwire and sprinting into the undergrowth. Jack followed, hot on his heels, pumping his arms and legs as hard as he could, knowing he had to get him before he got clear of the thick undergrowth. Taller and faster, Jack caught up with him in a few strides and tackled the kid hard into the ground on the edge of one of Haley's pits. God damn it, Jack panted, flipping the kid onto his back. You could have killed both of us. Todd burst into tears. I, I'm so, so sorry, Jack. I'm so, so sorry. Jack got up and hoisted him to his feet by the lapels of his jacket and pushed him back against one of the trees. Talk. The kid just blubbered and shook his head. Jack wasn't in the mood for playing around and slapped Todd in the face with an open hand. It had the desired effect. Todd stopped crying, a look of shock on his face. Talk, Todd. They, they promised me. They promised me we would be safe. As long as I, as long as I. Promised you what? What did those fuckers promise you, Todd? I swear to God. Now the betrayal was confirmed. Jack's rage began bubbling and boiling to the surface, hotter than ever. He pictured Robert's dead face, thought of Theo sacrificing himself to save Jesse and all the chaos and misery the treachery had brought down upon them. Then he saw Todd in front of him, weak and defenseless. All he had to do was place his hands around the kid's skinny neck and squeeze. They said we would be safe, that no one would die. I just had to show my loyalty. I... I had to tell them about Cold Springs and, and the operation, Operation Underdog. Jack went cold. There it was, the betrayal. The Chinese had planted Todd, used their kindness and inclusivity, and had him sell out Grandpa and Haley and everyone else in the camp in exchange for the false promise of their safety. They made me bring this back to camp. He pulled a small black object out of his pants pocket and held it out in his hand. There was no mistaking what it was, a transponder. Oh, you stupid, stupid kid, Jack spat. He grabbed the device, dropped it to the ground, and proceeded to stomp it to pieces with the heel of his boot. You just signed all of our death warrants. When are they coming? I don't know exactly but it's sometime today or tomorrow. Jack let go of Todd's jacket and placed his hands around his neck as the rage burned. No, Todd sobbed. Please, Jack, they promised. We'll be safe. Jack tensed, letting his hands squeeze. Todd began to choke, big fat tears crawling from his eyes and down his cheeks. Jack closed his eyes and relaxed his grip. No matter what the kid had done, he didn't have it in him to kill him in cold blood. You're done here, understand? If you want to live, you're going to turn around in the clothes on your back and walk away and keep walking. You can't come back, Jack finally said. If you do, you'll be executed. The camp will riot once they find out it was you. And Haley and Grandpa can't contain that. Not now. But where will I go? Todd whined, rubbing his throat. I don't care, Todd. But I wouldn't run to your Chinese buddies. They'll kill you as soon as they find out you're of no further use. But... Go, Todd, Jack said, pushing the kid who fell to the forest floor. If I see you again, I'll finish what I started. Todd looked up face muddied and tear-stained. Goodbye, Todd. The kid rolled onto his knees and climbed laboriously to his feet. He looked at Jack one more time before turning and heading deeper into the undergrowth. 
Jack waited a few minutes to make sure he didn't come back, then turned and broke into a run, heading back into camp. Once back within the perimeter, he found the camp strangely empty. Where was everybody? He stopped and looked around, then heard raised voices from the direction of the mess tent. It was too early for dinner, but the tent also doubled as a pseudo-town hall. Something was up. Jack sprinted to the tent just in time to see Grandpa stepping down from Chair Rock. Jack was pushing through the campmates milling around at the edge of the tent, unable to make out the hushed conversations, when a hand grabbed him. He swung around. It was Bradley. Jack tensed, ready to punch him in the face, when he said something that surprised him. I'm sorry, Jack. I really am. I was sure it was you. Huh? Grandpa and Haley just told us who the mole is. Look, I was just worried for the camp. You get it, right? Jack shook him off and made his way to where Grandpa and Haley stood in low conversation with Murphy and Aide. Find him and bring him to my tent, okay? Grandpa was saying. Jack, where have you been? We know who- Me too, sir. But we don't have time to- A small explosion, like the blast of a shotgun in the distance on the eastern side of camp, interrupted him. That was one of the tripwires, said Haley. They're here. Chapter 21 Stations, now! Grandpa's roar of command jolted everyone into action. Jack was moving before most, taking a shortcut by sprinting out of the mess tent and vaulting one of the trenches as he rushed to the weapons tent. Haley was there a split second after him, and they began to throw every variety of assault rifle they had on the rack onto the long table. Grab one and take your designated position, called Haley as their campmates, headed by Murphy, began to arrive. There was no time to be picky about weapons. They just had to grab what was at hand and get going. You and Murphy take a rifle and go, Jack. We need experienced people in those front positions. Okay, said Jack, grabbing an Armalite AR-10A2 and stuffing two spare magazines into his pockets. See you on the other side. Murphy ran with him. Jack, where is Todd? Not now. Let's- Where, Jack? Where the hell is he? Murphy kept pace with him, her own assault rifle held tight to her chest, waiting for an answer. He couldn't lie either, not to her. He admitted everything. I let him go, Murph, he said finally. I'd have done the same. Jack looked at her briefly, before gunfire in the distance caught their attention, prompting them to dive behind a fallen tree. You would have? Yep. Murphy shut off a burst of fire as Jack stared intently at the shadows between the trees. Right, Murph. Stay here with the others and keep them from advancing. Where are you going? She asked. But Jack was already gone, headed back in the direction of camp, leaving Murphy and the armed survivors that had been following on their heels. Threading his way back through the parade of wide-eyed alert survivors, all moving to man their designated stations, Jack had a plan. Recalling how he'd sniped the soldiers who had been attacking Katie, he didn't see why the same tactic, which had come naturally to him with his competition shooting experience, wouldn't work again. Tucking the gun close to him, he turned northwest before he reached the camp, heading deeper into the trees, knowing the Chinese had been approaching from a southeasterly direction. With legs pumping and heart racing, Jack ran a good quarter mile through the thick forest before turning a sharp right and beginning to wind his way around to flank the assaulting forces. The sporadic fire in the distance, mainly coming from the camp defenders, told him that the enemy were moving into place before they began an all-out assault. Jack slowed to a steady walk when he judged he was within 300 yards of their flank and ducked low, thankful that he'd chosen his khaki pants and green t-shirt to wear that morning. When he spied movement in the distance, he got down on his belly in the mud and leaves, and shuffled forward until he was behind a large rock. He took a deep breath to steady himself, then drew the rifle up to his shoulder, placing it on a crease in the rock and peering through the iron sight. It took his eyes a moment to become accustomed to the dappled light, but soon he was able to count off the half dozen or so soldiers moving stealthily through the shadows in between trees. It was a small band, 
perhaps a lead unit sent in to test or report on the camp's defenses. Either way, they were within range and moving closer to his people. He forced himself to relax, taking a deep breath before slowly exhaling until his lungs were empty. That's when he squeezed the trigger. His target's neck snapped horrifically, blood spurting against the bark of a tree beside him. Jack swiveled his barrel to the right and took the man behind him as the crack of his first shot reached them, revealing they were under fire. The second man dropped as the rest scattered, and he braced for the return fire. It came, but it was panicked and reactionary, and aside from a bullet whizzing over his head, nowhere near him. Thanks to the bowl-like acoustics of the shallow veil they were in, the soldiers had no idea what direction he had fired from. Jack scanned left and right, even as a voice called out what he assumed was cease fire in Mandarin. His aim fell upon a man who, comically, was hiding behind a tree, but on the wrong side, giving Jack a full view of his back. This was war, and Jack had no qualms about etiquette. He squeezed the trigger and caught the unsuspecting soldier dead center in the spine. This time the return fire was heavier and more on target, and Jack was forced to duck down behind the rock cradling his rifle as chips of rock and shredded foliage fell upon him. Again came the cease fire call, and the assault stopped. Jack remained where he was, aware that they could be waiting for him to pop his head up so they could take it off. That's when he heard the snap of a twig in the distance to his right. They were flanking him, just like he'd done to them. Jack quickly scrambled around the boulder, putting it between him and the direction of the sound. Peering around the edge, his belly in the grass, he aimed towards the thicket of trees and waited. He didn't have to wait long before spying movement. He switched his weapon to full auto. Sniping was not an option with the enemy this close and hidden by the underbrush. Three seconds later, a soldier materialized, a second following close behind. Jack fired a burst, rewarded immediately by a blood-curdling scream as the first soldier tumbled forward, holding his belly. He squeezed again, this time taking the soldier in the face as shots rang out from his comrade. They whizzed over Jack's hiding place, and he squeezed off a longer burst in the direction the fire had come from, sweeping right to left. He heard a grunt of pain, and the shooting ceased. There was a yell of Mandarin from Jack's left, closer now, no more than thirty yards, and more answers from behind. The six had been reinforced. Five kills would have to do for now. Scrambling back around the rock on hands and knees, he slung the rifle over his back and crawled back to the thicker part of the forest before gaining his feet and running to circle back to Murphy's position. Noting the heavy gunfire that had broken out closer to camp, he reloaded his rifle as he went. He slowed to a stop as he neared camp from the north, trying to make out how the battle was progressing. It was impossible to tell. The occasional scream told him that some of Haley's traps were being sprung, but those would only slow the attack, not end it. He was about to run again when he heard a whoosh in the distance, followed immediately by screams of agony and calls of run. Jack diverted from the path and climbed a small hill that gave a slightly elevated view of the vale. What he saw was like a punch to the gut. A fire had broken out. He watched an enormous tongue of flame shoot a hundred feet towards the camp, lighting up more trees and eliciting more agonized screams. Jack saw his campmates running back towards camp and in every other direction, for that matter. Chaos reigned. One familiar figure tried to rally them, though. It was Murphy, and she was heading a group of five who were making their way to the northeastern corner of the camp. He briefly wondered how Grandpa, Haley, and the others were faring at their various positions, before setting off at a run to meet Murphy. On lower ground, he lost sight of Murphy and the kids she was leading, but stayed true to the course he'd been following, which would eventually cross her path. It came upon him faster than anticipated, and he nearly barreled headlong into her, putting his hands up quickly when she swung her weapon towards him. Don't shoot, it's me. Murphy pulled up and looked to the sky before bending over with a hand on her knee as she caught her breath. What's happening? Nothing, Murphy said. Follow me. They broke through our line with the flamethrowers, and more are coming from the south. More? She nodded. 
Jesse got to the water tower and managed to patch through to Grandpa. More are coming. Way more. We need to get back into camp and regroup. Let's go. Murphy and Jack took off, racing back the short distance to the inner perimeter, which was marked by the covered pits with stakes. Be careful through here, Murphy said to their small group. Hopefully the enemy throw caution to the wind after seeing the retreat and a few get skewered, muttered Jack. The fighting hadn't begun long ago, but Camp Lisa was bleak. Injured kids were sitting and lying on the ground behind the barricades they'd set up around the inner circle of the camp. Jesse and Jen were moving amongst them, administering aid where they could. Jack looked down in shock when he saw the shapes of three bodies covered with a large blanket near the entrance to the mess tent. A small, blackened foot protruded from under one corner, and he promptly bent over and vomited onto the ground. The excitement he'd felt when the alarm was raised, and then during his own foray, had now switched to devastation and clarity upon seeing the results of the combat. In the end, they were just a bunch of kids against a highly trained army. If they'd stopped to think about it more logically at the beginning, they'd have seen that all their preparation was going to count for nothing when the real fighting began. Gunfire from the east and south was getting louder now, and more camp survivors were streaming in with every second that passed. There was an explosion somewhere to the east, and smoke from the fire set by the Chinese was starting to creep into camp. Rustling in the trees on the southern perimeter elicited shouts of horror, and Jack quickly raised his rifle as Haley and Aide burst into view, and ignoring his raised weapon, made a beeline for him. Haley's smudged face was etched with worry but she seemed unaware there was a bleeding gunshot wound in her left bicep. You've been shot, Jack said as he lowered his weapon. Haley looked down at her wound, then back up and around the camp. Never mind that now. We need to evacuate. Murphy and Jack swapped looks. But we're... Haley shook her head. No, we need to hold off the worst of them and get these kids into the truck. Jack's head spun. It was all coming undone so quickly. How would they fit everyone into the truck? Where would they go? Before he could even seek an answer to his unspoken questions, gunfire erupted from the tree line as Chinese soldiers breached the perimeter. Chapter 22 Jack felt a sharp sting on his right shoulder and ducked down behind a barricade. Safe for now, he raised his shoulder and looked relieved to find the wound was only a shallow furrow, left by a round that had skimmed him. Are you okay? asked Murphy. Yeah, only nip me. Murphy acknowledged him by firing over the barricade. Maybe you wouldn't mind joining in then? Aid was beside her, but Haley had vanished from sight, and he could only hope she'd been able to take cover too. He turned his head just in time to see a kid who was crouching behind a chair a few feet in front of him take a bullet straight to the head before he collapsed, lifeless. Jack felt his stomach flip again before slumping back down under the barricade where Murphy was reloading. He shook his head. There's too many. An agonized scream rang out from the direction of the soldiers, followed by more frantic Mandarin. That one is skewered, Murphy offered and ready to fire again. No, Jack said, putting his hand on the warm barrel. You heard, Haley. There's too many. Well, until I'm told otherwise. She began to rise, her gun at the ready. When the whiz of gunfire over their heads and into the top of the barrier caused her to drop back down just as quickly. Shit. Yeah, he said. We, we need to buy the others time, or no one is getting out. The words tasted like ashes in his mouth, but it was true. He knew it. Murphy knew it. This wasn't some fairy tale where everyone would make it out. This was reality, cruel and harsh. And if anyone was going to live, some of them would have to fight and lay their lives on the line to make that happen. Okay, she said, and they bumped fists. Aid, you find Haley and lead the survivors out to the truck. We'll lay down suppressing fire. He looked like he was going to argue, but then with a sharp nod, he got up, crouching low, and started calling the other survivors to him. Go, 
they both yelled to the kids who were frozen in place, too frightened of being shot to risk moving. Haley reappeared from deeper in the camp. Come on, everybody, she called, understanding immediately what Jack and Murphy were doing. She threw three magazines across to them. Give us five minutes, then make your way to the truck. Jack gave her the thumbs up with a rueful smile on his face, then turned and began firing with Murphy. Just us now, he said when he paused to reload. Murphy grunted and continued to fire before calling, reloading, and Jack took over. They worked in tandem like that for a few more minutes before they paused, and Jack sat back down with his back against the barricade. I have about half a magazine left. If we're going to follow, we need to do it now, while we still have ammo. Okay, said Murphy. I have three quarter of my last one left. How are we doing this? You go. I'll follow backwards and lay down fire. When I'm out, we'll swap. Let's do it. Murphy rose and charged the way the others had gone. Jack jumped up and followed, shooting blindly behind him, hoping it was enough to occupy them and praying a shot wouldn't punch his ticket before they reached the next barricade. They made it. I'm out, Jack panted. Okay, my turn. With heads low, the pair ran on, this time Jack leading the way while Murphy methodically laid down suppressing fire. They made it to the tents and out of sight of the enemy, finally, sprinting as hard as they could. Emerging from the tents on the other side, Jack skidded to a halt. Murphy bumped into him, nearly falling to the ground. Three dead Chinese, these ones all dressed in black, lay bleeding on the grass. One's head had been crushed by a rock, another one shot, and the last with a cut across his throat deep enough that Jack could see the bone of his spinal column gleaming in the mess. Near them, a blood-drenched aide sat with his back against a tree stump, with a long hunting knife gleaming crimson in his ham-sized fist. There was a dark, bloody patch on his belly. Shit, Jack said, kneeling beside him. You okay? A grunt. Better than them. God damn, Aid, said Murphy. Come on, we'll get you to the truck. Together, they managed to take most of Aid's weight and lead him along the narrow path towards the truck. When they got there, Haley was marshalling the last of the kids onto the first truck. It was already overcrowded. Behind it, the smaller truck, the one that had carried the team to the fuel facility, was almost full. When she was satisfied that they had as many of the survivors loaded on as possible, Haley stepped up to Jesse and handed her the keys. Go. Take the first truck, get out to the main road. Follow it north to the highway, then out around the lake and north. Keep going. Jesse frowned. You sure? Yes, Haley said, glancing over her shoulder as Jack and Murphy arrived with aid between them. Fuck. Go, Jesse. We'll be a few minutes behind you in the second truck. Go. Colonel Zhang Li arrived at the chopper and was greeted by Wong, who saluted him, then signaled the pilot with a whirl of his finger. The engine began to whine as Li brushed past Wong and climbed aboard. Once they were strapped in, the helicopter began to rise. Progress, snapped Li. Positive, sir. The two platoons have engaged from the east and south and are driving inward. Casualties. Light, as we expected, sir. And you have ensured the persons of interest will be captured alive. Wong wrung his hands. Those orders have been given, sir. But, of course, in the heat of battle, no excuses, Wong. They better be captured alive, or you'll be joining them in the ground. Yes, sir. How long? Wong checked his watch. Ten minutes, approximately, sir. They fell into silence, both lost in thought. Wong, nervous, but hopeful that this operation would bring him the promotion he'd so desperately craved for three years. Lee, excited to finally deliver the general the killers of his daughter, bringing the months-long mission to a close. Haley slammed the truck door shut, peering into the flatbed at the sixteen pairs of frightened eyes looking back at her from dirty, bloodied faces, hands gripping handguns, rifles, or anything they had grabbed in their hurry. Under their feet were a few bags of supplies containing bare essentials that had been thrown in at the last minute. This was it. 
travel light, and get the hell out of Dodge. Jesse leaned out the window, hands extended, which Haley gripped hard, and stepped forward to embrace her. You've got this girl, Haley said. I'm... Jesse stopped, fighting the urge to fall into a pit of self-doubt as the sound of gunfire continued in the background, punctuated by a scream. It seemed to focus her. I'll see you soon. Jesse settled into the driver's seat and hollered to the kids in the back to hold on tight. A second later, the truck tore off down the dirt track, heading northwest for the roads out of the forest. Godspeed, kids, whispered Haley. A burst of static came from the walkie-talkie on her belt, and she raised it as Murphy and Jack began to tend to aid. They were using a first aid kit they had found in the pile of supplies that didn't fit onto the truck. That you, old-timer? Only static. Hey, Dad. You read me? Over? Nothing. She swore and tucked it back into her belt, knowing she didn't have the luxury of time to keep trying the comms. She turned back to the others where Murphy was wrapping a wide bandage around Aid's midriff as Jack held him upright. That's it, said Haley. Make it tight and go around three or four times. Have we got everyone? Bradley's back in the middle of camp, said Murphy. He mumbled something about a surprise for them. The words were barely out of her mouth when Bradley came running into the clearing. Behind him, a pall of smoke, much blacker than the smoke from the fires the Chinese had set, began rising into the sky. Gasoline, he blurted as he pulled to a skidding halt in front of them. I poured two barrels into the trenches and lit it up. No way are they getting past that in a hurry. The others, they got out? Yeah, Jesse's gone. It's just us now. So time to go. Everyone to the truck. Aid, you ride up front with me. The ashen-faced Aid didn't argue, but he was strong enough to gently extricate himself from Jack's arms. I'm okay to walk. Good, said Haley. Let's go. Chapter 23 Jesse's hands gripped the truck's steering wheel like the reins of a wild stallion as the vehicle lurched and bucked along the dirt track. Her speed and the poor condition of the road threatened to crash them headlong into the trees on more than a few occasions. Suddenly from behind her, over the roar of the engine, she heard shouts and screams that were different to those elicited by the wild ride. Everything all right back there? Her breath stuck in her throat as she focused on the track's winding path, the speedometer creeping up to 60 mph. They've got bikes. What? Motorbikes. On cue, she spotted a soldier in full uniform bent over the handlebars of a motocross bike, zipping through the woods to their right. He disappeared briefly, and she yelled to Ruby, who was riding shotgun. Where did he go? Can you see him? Ruby didn't have a chance to answer when the bike reappeared from the trees next to them and sped past, veering onto the road in front of them. Shit, Jesse yelled, twitching the wheel, whipping the truck to the left and slowing down. This seemed to play right into the soldier's hands, and he leaned over, pulling an object that Jesse realized quickly was a machine pistol from a fixed holster and aimed it behind him. He let off a volley of bullets, which pinged into the front of the truck. Without thinking, Jesse slammed her foot down on the gas and swerved left to avoid the gunfire. The rider adjusted and let off another burst that stitched along the hood of the truck, one round piercing the windshield right between her and Ruby. That's it, fucker, yelled Jesse, and zeroed on the rider. Apparently confident he could kill her before she hit him, he let off another burst of fire, which went awry when his front tire struck a rock. He managed to keep his balance, but Jesse had now closed the gap and the bulber kissed the back of the soldier's bike. The bike flipped backwards, both it and the rider striking the windshield and clattering away either side of the speeding vehicle. Holy shit, Ruby cried. You got him good. But it wasn't over. From behind, the roar of more bikes. You packing? Jesse called to Ruby as she weaved the truck through the last of the dirt track and skidded into a half spin as she turned onto the asphalt of the road leading out northwest from the park. In answer, Ruby pulled a 12-gauge shotgun from her right side, much to Jesse's surprise. Yep. Jesse smirked. Nice. Can you shoot it is the question. 
She checked the mirrors, watching as one of the kids pulled a handgun up from the flatbed and fired at the soldiers behind them. To her pleasure, the kid, Jared, who was only 14, managed to get a headshot and one of the bikes veered off the road and straight into a tree. The surviving pursuer fired back, and Jesse saw Jared fall backwards as the bike crossed into the other lane and sped up the right-hand side of the truck. Quick, Ruby, he's coming up on your side. Ruby nodded, her jaw set and red hair streaming in the wind. As she moved off the seat, rested one knee on it, then pumped the shotgun, aiming it through the window, but careful to keep the barrel out of sight. The bike tore up their flank, and when he was level with the passenger side door, Ruby squeezed the trigger. The shot was loud in the enclosed space, and the sheer force of the recoil sent her tiny frame slamming into Jesse. After she got the wheel back under control, Jesse looked in the mirrors to see the crumpled form of the soldier and, a few feet away, his steaming motorbike. Jesse let out a long sigh and looked at Ruby, who was back in her seat, staring down at the shotgun in disbelief. Did I? Yeah, he's down. Good work, Ruby. Jessie looked over her shoulder, and much to her relief, saw Jared sitting up and looking back at her. He was holding his shoulder, but gave her a thumbs up. She couldn't see any more bikes, and there was no sign of Haley in the second truck. She slowed as the road they were on came to a junction, and turned right. This should take us to the highway, Jessie said, finally relaxing as the adrenaline in her system began to dissipate. The air breezing through the windows was refreshing, and everyone was still alive and in one piece in the flatbed. She allowed a sense of optimism to wash over her. It receded quickly when they rounded a bend and saw in the distance, across all lanes of the highway, a line of green-painted vehicles with flashing lights and soldiers running this way and that, putting the finishing touches on a roadblock. Jack and Murphy were the last onto the back of the truck. He slapped the side of the vehicle and screamed for Haley to go. She didn't need telling twice, and Jack almost lost his seat as the truck took off and made quick work of the winding track that would take them out from the deep of the forest. Once they made the paved road, Jack took the time to look back. The horizon was black with smoke, and he spotted several helicopters hovering over the spot they had just fled. That was a good move with the gasoline, he said to Bradley. His nemesis of the last few days nodded and smiled. I figured we wouldn't be needing it, said the other kid. Then his expression changed, and he pointed at the road ahead. Is that? It was a mangled body at the side of the road. There was debris all over the road, and as Haley slowed to weave through and around it, they saw the wrecked bike in the long grass on the other side. It's a Chinese soldier. They must have been waiting on the road said Murphy. Jack strained to look further up the road. Sure enough, they were almost past it when he saw more wreckage and another crumpled body at the foot of a tree well off the side of the road. Looks like Jesse outmaneuvered them, said Bradley. Jack didn't comment. He was too tense, knowing the possibility they would round a bend and find the truck in a wreck or worse was high. Damn, another one, called Murphy. Jack let out a breath and looked over the side as they passed another corpse, this one missing most of its face, courtesy of a shotgun blast. Whoops of joy went up from the other kids in the truck. He didn't join in. His nerves were on edge, suddenly anxious how easy their escape had seemed. Sure, the firefight in the forest had been intense and they'd lost a lot of people, but it didn't seem quite right. Why hadn't the Chinese just obliterated them with artillery? Once they had their location, it would have been easy enough. Jack scrambled back through the flatbed, nodding and apologizing to his friends as he squeezed up to the truck's cabin. There, he tapped on the glass window, which Aid slid open. He put his head in and asked, Hey, has Grandpa touched base? No, Haley replied, then added optimistically, Not yet. Right. Why? This seems too easy. Why didn't they just bomb the camp? I was contemplating the same question myself, Haley said. Should we stop? What if we're heading into a trap? We can't stop, Jack. 
What purpose would it serve? Look, just keep everyone hunkered down back there. We're almost to the highway. Jack nodded. She was right, of course. What would they do if they stopped? Hide? They were already in a trap and the jaws were closing. He shared a look with Murphy as he squeezed past her, one that filled him with a warmth that was alien to the situation they were in. What was that? He sat back down between Bradley and Jen, and they searched his face for clues to what he'd been discussing. We keep an eye out and hunker down if it gets rough, he said. We're almost free. His voice was cut off as Jen raised her hand. Do you hear that? She said. Hear what? That. One of the younger kids in the truck with them, a girl called Sophia, cocked her head. I think it's a helicopter. There they were, like ants on the floor ready to be squashed, Lee thought, as he watched the truck below them. The pilot maneuvered expertly over the road, winding its way through the forest to track the truck, but also to get a good look ahead. Sure enough, in the distance, Zhang Li could make out the highway blockade that had been set up in place, on orders followed by Wong. Well done, Zhang Li conceded. You've done well. I can see they've already had casualties. Pointing at a position about 300 yards short of the roadblock, fire and smoke belched up from an overturned truck. The area around it lit up with sparks of gunfire. No doubt, the soldiers engaging with the rebels who had survived the crash. Not for long, he thought. Below, and oblivious to the fate of their comrades, Zhang Li watched the truck following the same route to the blockade. But he wasn't here to be passive, and he wouldn't fail this time, not like Huntsville. Bending over, he pulled a heavy green box out from under the seat. Wong looked at him curiously. I reconsidered my position. You were right when you said anything can happen in the heat of battle. Do you agree, Wong? Yes, Colonel. I understand completely. Pulling out the light machine gun with great care, he positioned it on a mounted stand at the edge of the helicopter's open door and secured it in place with the help of Wong, then stood aside as his subordinate loaded it. Stand aside, Wong. He smiled thinly. I deserve this, don't you think? Pilot, take us in closer. Over. Roger, Colonel. Going in. The helicopter's rapid descent gave Zhang Li's stomach a jolt, but it was a pleasurable one. It excited him, and the thrill of the hunt consumed him. Gripping the LMG, he swiveled it on its stand and aimed at the truck as they descended rapidly. Haley, floor it, Jack screamed as he pushed those around him down onto the bed of the truck. The helicopter swept over their position unleashing a hell-like storm of high-caliber bullets that punctured the road behind them as the gun's operator zeroed in on them. Haley swerved left and right over the road, tires squealing, sending kids bucking and flying about in the back, hanging on for dear life. Jack, buried by the limbs of his comrades, locked eyes with Jen. Hers were filled with fear, but not panicked. They'd been through similar danger in the past and survived and he hoped they'd look back and laugh at this sometime. Haley was doing a good job of veering out of the line of fire, but the chopper pilot was onto her and banked right so that the gunner on his left would have a better and uninterrupted line of sight. Hold on tight, Haley screamed, and swung the truck off the road. It was a last-ditch effort to avoid the chopper by getting under the trees, but Jack knew it was almost certainly hopeless. The mechanical, staccato noise of the machine gun continued above them as the truck careened towards the trees. Jack saw a decent-sized gap between two trees and knew that's what Haley was aiming for. He was about to yell, hold on again, when suddenly the truck nosedived into a ditch that had been hidden by long grass. Jack tried to brace, but the force of the impact as it hit the ground threw him forward and over the top of the cabin. Jack lay on the grass looking into the impossibly blue sky, wondering if he was dead. 
The noise of the helicopter and groaning around him told him instantly he was not. Dazed and dizzy, he lurched to his feet and looked around. Everything sounded distorted, and he felt sick in the stomach. The chopper was less than 300 yards away, about 200 yards high, and it looked like the operator of the gun was trying to reload it. Gunfire further down the road drew his attention, and he saw the wreck of the first truck and realized Jesse and the others were under heavy fire. Behind them, the helicopter whined, and Jack turned again as the pilot descended to just 40 feet above the road, its blades whipping up dust and grass as the large machine gun muzzle turned in their direction. Run to Jesse, called Haley, her voice cutting through the fog in his head. We'll make our last stand there. He went to take a step, but something soft bumped his foot and almost caused him to trip. When he looked down, he saw little Sophia, her head twisted at an acute angle blue eyes staring sightlessly into the same sky he'd been looking at a few seconds before. Run, Jack, said Murphy, grabbing him by the collar and pulling him. A deep sob escaped his lips as he allowed himself to be dragged along. So deep was his shock, he didn't hear the sound of hope from the heavens. The roar of Grandpa's Curtis P-36 Hawk as it descended at speed its guns suddenly singing their own staccato rat-a-tat-tat. Chapter 24 Howdy, assholes, said Grandpa through gritted teeth. His beautiful, shiny, patched-up Betsy cut through the air like a hawk, swooping in low over the adjacent trees and tearing up to the highway from a right angle. The gunfire shredded the roadblock to pieces, sending Chinese soldiers scattering. Once past, he pulled the joystick back and hard to the left, and Betsy gained altitude, banking back towards the road, where the second truck had come to a standstill. He was only sorry it had taken him so long to get here. He hadn't expected the ambush at the garage, but then the five soldiers they'd sent for him hadn't expected some old coot to be sneaking through the trees with an AK-47 and a 9mm Glock. It had been pretty intense, and without the element of surprise, he wouldn't have survived. As it was, nestled tight in the cockpit, his blood-drenched hands struggled to maintain a grip on the joystick. He hadn't escaped unscathed. He'd been hit in the left shoulder, and another bullet had left a deep furrow in his side between the rib and hip. The plane straightened and began to follow the ribbon of asphalt below. But he only had eyes for the black helicopter that had turned its side to the people running. He put his finger back on the trigger of the guns and was about to squeeze when a hail of bullets from behind struck the tail of the aircraft. Suddenly, Betsy tried to spin to the left, and he knew instantly the stabilizers on the tail had been damaged. It took all of his strength to hold the joystick straight with his good right arm. There was no way he could fire the guns with his nerve-damaged left arm. Ahead of him, the gunner on the chopper opened fire on the survivors running from the second truck. Oh, well, let's see how you like a serving of hot apple pie, bitches. He wasn't going home, but he'd make sure that at least the assholes and the chopper didn't either. He pushed the joystick forward, still wrestling to hold Betsy on an even keel as he dived towards the helicopter. The pilot and occupants were oblivious to the incoming danger, intent on wiping out the escapees. Grandpa took the opportunity to look down as he sped towards the chopper and saw the figure leading his people stop and look up at Betsy. It was Haley. Beautiful, strong Haley. Her dark hair blowing in the wind. A tear fell from his eyes as he lifted his limp left hand in a wave goodbye. Goodbye, my baby girl. No, Dad! Haley screamed. Jack and Murphy stopped next to her and watched in awe as the old plane dived towards the chopper. In the flying machine, Colonel Lee saw the leader of the group below pause and look skyward. He ceased firing. What is she? He leaned forward and followed her gaze. The sight of the old warplane was like a slap in the face. Incoming! He screamed. But by the time the warning had left his lips, it was too late. He heard Wong scream behind him. 
The last sight that registered in his brain was the grinning face of the old man, steering death his way at an impossible speed. Lee's world was swallowed then in searing heat and light as the plane torpedoed into the helicopter, engulfing both machines in a blazing ball of fire and sending twisted, burning metal to the road top. Jack grabbed both Murphy and Haley and pushed them to the ground as a wave of heat scorched the air, carrying with it pieces of burning wreckage and debris. Miraculously, none of them were hurt, and when he knew it was safe, he climbed off them and helped them get back up to their feet as they surveyed the damage. Jack could see Haley was in shock, but the fighting wasn't over. From the blockade, soldiers who had survived Grandpa's strafing were still firing at the survivors of the first truck. Come on, we need to get to the others. Haley seemed to come to her senses, and the three of them began running again. Jack avoided looking at the broken bodies scattered around them as they joined the survivors behind the overturned truck. Jen and Aid were already there, along with the others who had survived their own truck crash and the subsequent helicopter assault. Jack gauged the numbers on both sides, and it was clear that Grandpa's aerial intervention had significantly evened the odds. He felt hope begin to burn in his mind, hope that they might find a way out of this after all. It appeared Haley had been doing the same calculations. We've got to push through, she mustered finally, and Jack could tell it summoned a lot of guts and energy for her to assert herself. Aid, Jesse, Ruby, and Jen, I want you to lay down heavy fire with everyone else while Murphy, Jack, Bradley, and I attack from the left. Once everyone was across the plan, the cover team began to fire and the four attackers broke cover and in a crouching run, headed for a wrecked jeep at the far left end of the barricade. The cacophony of blazing cover fire from behind them did the trick, and Jack seized the moment to lead the others around the wreckage. Clearly, the soldiers behind the barricade hadn't expected such a bold move from children, and the group of armed campmates took them completely by surprise. A brief firefight ensued, and they killed five soldiers, the last two fleeing into the trees to the left of their position. Jack whooped and high-fived Murphy before he turned to celebrate with Bradley and Haley. The happy smile died on his lips when he saw Bradley on his back, with Haley kneeling over him. Jack saw the hole in his forehead just before Haley put a handkerchief over his face. When she stood up, her face was devoid of expression. She took a final look around and then took both Jack and Murphy by the hand. Come on, let's go and get the others. Compartmentalizing their grief, to deal with at a later time. Haley and the older kids, including Jack, shepherded the survivors, all 14 of them, through to the other side of the barricades. They found two Chinese vehicles still drivable. One looked like the equivalent of a Hummer, and the other was a bullet-riddled but miraculously working pickup truck. It would be a tight squeeze, but they had enough room for everyone. Under Haley's guidance, they siphoned fuel from the other wrecked vehicles and loaded as much ammunition and weaponry as they could carry. Jack, are you good to drive the pickup? Haley asked. Yep. Any ideas where we should go? Yes. Albany, New York. Murphy laughed. That's very specific. Why Albany? Well, Grandpa and I haven't told any of you, but we've been picking up chatter. Apparently, someone launched a counterattack against the Chinese a month ago, and they've abandoned the territory east of the Appalachians, and Albany has been mentioned a lot. We, I, think it's worth checking out. She was assaulted with questions. What counterattack? Is it the army? Is the president alive? I can't answer any of those questions. She called over the top of them. I can tell you I don't think it's the army although I have no idea what could have driven them back if it wasn't. What I can tell you is, it's no use staying here. The camp is gone, and the invaders are in full control of Texas. If anyone has a better idea, shoot. No one did, so the decision was made. Albany, New York, it was. Epilogue
You were right, you know, Jack remarked as he leaned against the rails of the truck's bed, swigging some water. Haley, who took the canister from Jack to take her own drink, smiled. I'm always right. Got raised by the best. That I can't argue with. Good, she said. But which time are you talking about? This, he said, gesturing to the city ten miles distant, which from this position looked like it sprouted from the middle of a forest. They were on the Helderberg Escarpment, overlooking Albany and its surrounds. The view was breathtaking, and the ideal spot to survey what they hoped might become their new home. Their travels had taken longer than anticipated, with the scarcity of fuel and fresh water. But they'd made it, and word they'd picked up from other groups and travelers they'd met along the way was that a large resistance had dug itself in at Albany. Ah, Haley replied. Well, we're close now, but I'm not taking credit until we get there and find it's what we're looking for. Murphy appeared and went over to Jack slipping her arms around him and looking out. The view, she whispered. It's beautiful. She wasn't lying. As the late summer sun set across the city, streaks of magenta, red, and orange stretched out across the horizon. They drank in the rich display of colors, taking the time to really enjoy their rest. It had been so long since Texas, and they had all seen so much. Haley smiled. Jack and Murphy becoming a couple had happened naturally and quickly, so that barely any of them noticed. It made her happy. Both of them, all of them, for that matter, deserved to find what happiness they could in this new, harsh world. It brought her dad to mind, and she suddenly remembered something from her very last conversation with him. I have something for you, Jack, she said. You do? Yeah, wait here. Haley went back to the trucks and found the fanny pack she'd carried all the way from Texas with her. She rummaged through the small compartment until she found what she was looking for amongst the assorted items, palming it before heading back to the lookout. Murphy took her leave when Haley got back. Oh, you don't have to go. It's no big secret, said Haley. It's fine. I'll go help the others top up the canteen. What's up? said Jack. I have something I was supposed to give you, but I forgot all about it. I should have done it sooner. Oh? He was genuinely taken aback and couldn't figure for the life of him what it could be. I think you have excuses for not remembering. Haley smiled. Yeah, well, here it is she said, and held out her hand. Laying in her palm was a copper penny. Jack plucked it up and inspected it. It was stamped 1914, and the side profile of Abe Lincoln adorned one side. It was my dad's lucky penny, said Haley, her voice cracking. His dad gave it to him on his deathbed. He gave it to me just before the attack and said I should give it to you for helping with Betsy, and that he hoped it would bring you as much luck as it had brought him. Jack was suddenly overwhelmed with emotion and unsure what to say or do. Haley spared him the need to do anything by taking him in her arms and hugging him tight. Thanks, he said when they parted, wiping a tear from his eye. Grandpa was the best. I miss him. Haley put her arm around his shoulder, and they walked back to the parking lot. You and me both, kid. Come on, let's get everyone packed and head into Albany. I've got a good feeling about this. <laughs>